Okay, welcome back. So today, uh, we're not adding any new functionality. This is gonna be a relatively shorter video where instead of adding functionality, we're gonna take a look at the structure of our programming and make it a bit more flexible so that the next few lessons are gonna be easier because we'll have a more flexible footing to build upon. So, uh, thanks for watching and let's get started. So where we left off last time, we have our systems working. If we make a match underneath these ice slash jelly pieces, and the piece goes away, everything refills. And yeah, for the most part, things are working pretty well. However, with what we're planning on adding, which is a bunch more obstacle pieces, so something like the licorice blocks, something like the icing blocks, and something like the chocolate blocks, we're going to want a much more flexible system to do things than we currently have. The way that I currently have architected the system is fine for what it is, but if we add more stuff, it's gonna quickly turn into spaghetti. So what I, we're gonna be doing today, it's not a very glamorous episode. We're gonna be going through our code base and we're gonna be refactoring specific things in order to make the next few episodes much easier to do. So uh, let's dive right in and get started. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna take a look at the grid script here. So I'm gonna go into distraction-free mode. And um, I did this off camera, which I shouldn't have. This is actually the second time I'm recording this episode. Um, I changed this from calling it, I think I called it restricted move, to restricted fill. Because this is actually something I'm, it's actually restricting the fill and not the movement of the pieces. So um, I changed the name of this method and then every place I called it, I changed the name as well. So it's being called in spawn pieces. So if not in restricted fill, and it's also being called in uh, collapse columns. I can just find it over here. Uh, collapse columns, it's also being called there, and it's also being called in refill columns. So that's one of the things I did. Now the other thing I'm gonna do here, since there's a lot of different kinds of tiles that could cause a restriction on filling, so for example, the blank spaces restrict whether or not you're gonna fill a piece there, but so do the concrete tiles and the chocolate tiles. So rather than having three separate um, little for loops in here that do essentially the same thing, just with a different array, I'm gonna create a function that I'm just gonna to use to check to see if um, a specific position is inside that array. And if it is, it'll return true. And then that way, I only have to have this block of code once, and then I'll call that block of code uh, three times for three times for those uh, different arrays that need it. So I'm going to call this uh, function. We'll say is in array, and this is going to take two arguments. It's going to take an array as an argument that we're checking, and an item that we're checking to see if it's in the array. So. It's essentially just the same thing we were doing here. It's just we're making it more generic so that it's more flexible and more reusable. Uh, so we'll say for i in, instead of specifically saying empty spaces, we're gonna say array.size. So now we can pass any array we want to. If array i is equal to item, return true. Otherwise, we're gonna return false. And the reason that we're doing this is, like I said, this is gonna make things much simpler to look at and much more readable uh, versus what would quickly turn into spaghetti if we continued with this pattern. So instead of doing that loop here for empty spaces.size, I'm instead gonna say, I'm instead gonna say if is in array and then tell it the array I want, which is empty spaces and the item and the item I want to check, which is place. So if that's true, then I'm going to return true. And if that's false, I'm going to return false. Uh, that's not how you spell return. Uh, okay, cool. Now I can get rid of this second return false. Now the reason that I'm doing it this way, like I said, is now when I'm checking in the concrete spaces and in the chocolate spaces, I can just have those function calls be almost the exact same thing as it is here. And then that way I'm not repeating this for loop again and again and again when I don't need to. Okay, sorry for that weird 
cut. I had a sudden bout of sneezing. <laughs> um, all right, so the next thing I want to check, or the next thing I want to take a look at uh, refactoring here is something that I've been wanting to refactor for a while, and we might as well do it now. So um, it's in our find matches function here. This bit of code is just so much spaghetti, and we need to we need to do some stuff about that. So well, let's take a look at exactly what's happening so that we can talk about kind of the main principles of object-oriented programming and how we can make this specific method conform a little more to the main principles of object-oriented programming. So the main idea behind um, OOP, object-oriented programming, is you want to be able to take the tasks that you want the computer to do and break them into smaller tasks. And that way, those smaller tasks are going to end up being more efficient because rather than having it do one great big long task, if anybody remembers programming in like basic where everything was just one big long task, you can instead um, have little teeny tiny tasks that you can call and uh, bring back values as you require them. Uh, that way you're kind of making your code as if it's just a bunch of pieces of Lego bricks that snap together nicely. So you can use those Lego bricks to make something that it would be difficult to make if you were trying to just carve it out of stone as it was. So I don't know if that's a good metaphor or not. <laughs> could let me know in the co in the comments if that was a bad metaphor. So what we're doing here is we're checking to see uh, if all pieces i minus one j dot color um, is equal to the current color, and then if the one to the right is equal to the current color, and then there's a few different things we're doing. We're doing we matched and dim, matched and dim matched and dim, and we're doing it for three different things. Actually, six different things if we count the up and down as well. So I'm going to add a new function here that's going to do, and I know that we're not always gonna to wanna to do the dim. Some of you have already done this though. You can use that dim function that we have on the piece to throw in some other effects. For example, um, I'm sorry, I forget your name. There's a gentleman in the Discord who showed off his um, match three game that looks really, really cool. He's using a tween node to make the pieces go smaller before they disappear. And you can just throw that in the dim method. Um, you could also call a particle from there, which we'll be doing later. Uh, and you could also call an explosion effect from there. So this dim function here is actually really useful. Uh, so we're going to leave it. So I'm going to call my new function, uh, call this function match and dim. And then we need to tell it what we're going to match and dim. So I'm going to need to have an item to call match and dim on. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to do pretty much exactly what I was doing up here, but I'm going to be able to simplify my code quite a bit. So I'm going to say uh, item.matched equals true and item.dim. And there we go. Now, by moving those two lines here, I can now take a look at my function and where I was calling all pieces ij matched and all pieces ij dim, I'm instead just gonna do uh, match and dim, and then I'm gonna pass in all pieces i, and then was this one j? Or was this one j minus one? Yeah, this one was j minus one. To give it something to apply the match and dim to. And then I can do the same thing for ij. So match and dim all pieces i j. Oops. All right. And then uh, I'll do match and dim again for this one. Come here. Match and dim. And then this is all pieces i and then j plus one. And I can do the same stuff here for uh, the vertical matches. So this is, wait, did I do? Ah, I was doing the wrong ones. Good Lord. This is supposed to be i minus one. And this is supposed to be plain j. And this is supposed to be i plus one. 
Good lord. All right. That's better. And then uh, on these, these are the ones where the J is changing. So, match and dim. I feel like I could probably fast forward this at this point because you guys get the idea. So I'm going to do just that. Okay, so now you could even make this a little bit simpler by um, having a function that checks to see if a piece isn't null. So like, for example, we could have uh, another function to say is null. Let's actually do that. That's going to make our lives a little bit easier. and It's going to make our code more readable. So I'm going to make a function that's called uh, is piece null. And we're going to pass in a piece as an argument. And all we're going to do here is we're going to say if all pieces i, j is null, or not all i, j, if, uh, oh, okay. So to check this, we're going to not send in a piece, but we're going to send in a column in a row. So let's do column row. And if all pieces column row is null, return true, otherwise return false. So then here, when I'm doing all these checks to see if uh, all pieces i minus 1j is null or not, I can just say if is piece null, um, actually if not is piece null, because I want it to check to make sure it's not null. If not, is piece null. And I can do i minus 1, j. And that's a little simpler than what I was doing before. Uh, and I can actually apply that to the rest of these here. And you can create another function to check for color. Um, we could create another function even to move all three of these to be matched and dim. Like I could make another function called uh, match and dim three, and then pass in three arguments, one for each piece, and then I could call match and dim three, and then have it be all pieces, um, you know, so you can, you can make your code much more usable. Now, the thing with refactoring is a lot of times you don't see how you can make your code more usable or more modular and more reusable uh, and more flexible until after you've already made it. So, a lot of times when you're working on a big project, you can come back and think, well, you know, I could have done this better by doing this. Uh, and the key, I think, is to find a balance between adding functionality and adding structure. So like this video, we're not adding any new functionality. In fact, let's make sure it still works to make sure I didn't mess anything up too poorly or too much. Oh, it looks, it looks like I might have messed something up. Um, Identifier not found. Oh, <laughs> I misspelled pieces. Um, what line is that on? Uh, 195. There we go. Is that the only one I misspelled? Looks like. Um, so, like I was saying, what we've done so far it doesn't add any functionality. The game works the exact same way it did, you know, 15 minutes ago. It's just that now we've made it so that it's more readable and being more readable means that there's a higher likelihood that we can have somebody else come in and understand what we were trying to do without needing to comment everything and then it also makes it so that you yourself will understand it better if you come back to this project in a week or two so in my opinion um, one of the hardest things to do when you're making a new project especially if it's a project you're building from scratch and you're kind of you know making it up as you go is to find a good mix between something that is usable and interesting to you so that you can keep moving and something that has a good structure so that you're building something that is easy to build upon. So yeah, that's my little lecture on, uh, on why refactoring is good and why you need to stop every once in a while on a project to make sure that things are working like they should. So um, yeah, shorter video today, I know. Tomorrow we're going to have a video on how to add the licorice locks tiles. Um, licorice locks, if you don't know, are tiles that just kind of sit on top of everything like the ice tiles do. And 
you make a match underneath them, you still get rid of them, but how they differ from the ice tiles is you cannot move a piece that's underneath a licorice lock, either out or move another piece into it. So that's what we're covering next. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask me down in the comments down below. Uh, you can find the assets I'm using on itch.io. And if you'd like to support the channel, you can always throw me a donation there. I would never mind that, but super not necessary. Um, you can follow me on Twitter to find out when I post new videos. You can join my Discord where I'm chatting pretty much every day. And yeah, I uh, hope everybody out there is having themselves a wonderful day.